Section two of Nature Near Home and Other Papers by John Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edith Fern. Nature Near Home and Other Papers by John Burroughs. Section two New Gleanings in Old Fields. Part one Live Natural History. Recently, while reading Thoreau's journal, I wondered why his natural history notes, with which the journal abounds, interested me so little. On reflection, I saw that it was because he contented himself with making only a bare statement of the fact. He did not relate it to anything else, or interpret its meaning. There is a great deal of bald, dry natural history of this kind in his journal, which he never wove together into a living texture. When he simply tells me, I see a downy woodpecker tapping on an apple tree, and here, when I have passed, his sharp metallic note he has not interested me in the woodpecker he must string the bird on his thoughts in some way he must relate him to my life or experience the facts of natural history become interesting the moment they become facts of human history all the ways of the wild creatures in getting on in the world interest us because we have our ways of getting on in the world all their economies antagonisms failures devices appeal to us for the same reason Thoreau's description of the battle of the ants in Walden is intensely interesting because it is so human. Valor, heroism, stir us in whatever field they appear. As I write, a little chippy comes among the vines on my porch looking for nesting material. The old spring impulse to increase and multiply is strong upon her. She tugs at the strings that tie the vines. She scrutinizes every branch for some shred or bit that will serve her purpose. She interests me, and I lend her a hand by releasing some of the strings which she could not manage. I am familiar with her problem, as we all are. The cliff swallows daintily gathering mud at the edges of a puddle in the road, lifting their wings and standing on tiptoe, as it were, to guard against soiling their plumage, is a sight I will always pause to witness. Yesterday I sat for an hour in the woods near a dead maple stub in which a flicker was excavating her nest. At intervals the hammering would cease, and the bird, on her guard against the approach of stealthy enemies, would appear at the opening and take a long look. Finally, when she discovered me, she came out and went off in the woods, and seemed to have some conversation with her mate. All the industries and ways and means among the animals are interesting. A chipmunk carrying nuts and seeds to her den, a red squirrel cutting off the chestnut burrs, too impatient to wait for the frost to open them on the trees, even a woodchuck carrying dry grass and stubble into his hole for a nest, arrest the attention. The currents of life everywhere, the lampreys piling up the stones in the creek bottom for a nest, the muskrat in the fall building his aquatic tent with mouthfuls of sedge grass, excite our interest. In May all the seed-eating and nut-eating creatures are hard put to it to obtain food. The red squirrel comes in front of my door and eats the sterile catkins of the butternut, and they evidently help tide him over this season of scarcity. One morning a gray squirrel, in his quest for a breakfast, invaded the tree. The red squirrel soon spied him and hustled him out of it very spitefully. The gray went undulating along the top of the stone wall, the picture of grace and ease, while the red, with his tail kinked, was in hot pursuit. To find an interest in natural history, one must add something more than the fact. One must see the meaning of the fact. I feel no especial interest in the kingbird that alights on the telephone wire in front of me. But when he climbs high up in the air and picks some invisible insect from out the apparently empty space and brings it back to his perch, I am interested. It was a characteristic act. The fox is interesting for his cunning, the skunk and porcupine for their stupidity. We see in the last two how the weapons of defense which nature has so liberally bestowed upon them have left no room for the exigencies of life to develop their wits. The novel, the extraordinary, the characteristic, the significant, always interest us. The human bore is a person who has no conception of what constitutes the interesting. He or she pours out his own private experiences upon us as if they were of the same interest to us as to him. How prone we are to think our special ailments are of universal interest, but how rarely is this the case. One afternoon two cuckoos flying side by side pass my door. In the morning they passed again in the same way and going in the same direction. I became interested. I said, this means business. Following the course they took, I went straight to a clump of red thorn trees a hundred yards distant, and there was the nest with young more than half-grown. They were black-billed cuckoos. 
the mother bird chided me in that harsh guttural staccato note of hers and kept her place on a branch near the nest one of the three young got out of the rude nest and perched on a twig holding its head or neck nearly vertical its pronounced stubby quills and peculiar attitude gave it an unbird-like look the cuckoos seem to time their nesting with that of the tent caterpillars upon which they feed as the supply of these orchard pests and many other similar pests have been nearly exterminated by the cold wet may of the previous year nineteen seventeen it would have been very interesting to know how the birds made up for the deficiency what was the substitute but i could not find out nearly every cuckoo's nest i have happened to find has been on a thorn bush why do they choose this tree what special enemy are they on their guard against our cuckoos evidently lay their eggs at longer intervals than the other birds in the present case one of the young was clearly several days older than its fellows this fact with the rude skeleton of a nest suggests some reminiscence of the habits of the european cuckoo a parasitical bird the wild life around one becomes interesting the moment one gets into the current of it and sees its characteristics and by-play the coons that come down off the mountain into my orchard for apples on the chill november nights the fox that prowls about near me and wakens me by his wild vulpine squall at two o'clock in the morning the woodchucks burrowing in my meadows and eating and tangling my clover and showing sudden terror when they spy me peeping over the stone wall or coming with my rifle the chipmunk leaving a mound of freshly dug earth conspicuous by the roadside while his entrance to his den is deftly concealed under the grass or strawberry vines a few yards away the red squirrel spinning along the stone wall his movements apparently controlled by the electric-like waves of energy that run along his tail and impart to it a new curve or kink every moment or chipping up my apples and pears for the seed and snickering and cachinating as if in derision when i appear upon the scene how much there is in the lives of all these creatures that we should find keenly interesting if we only knew how to get at it this rainy morning i saw two red squirrels make a wild dash through my garden one in hot pursuit of the other a woven wire fence was in the way the fleeing one cleared one of the meshes neatly but his pursuer intent on his enemy blundered and doubled up against the obstruction and was delayed a moment how much i wanted to know what the mad racing meant and how it resulted the red squirrel is a perky feather-edged creature the hottest and most peppery rodent we have in our woods and orchards every hair of him like a live wire and many of his movements are to me quite unaccountable the search for the elements of the interesting in nature and in life in persons and in things well is an interesting search end of section two recording by edith fern southern california fall two thousand eight